Good afternoon. Welcome to Remaking the Economy, Wage Justice Now. I'm Rithika Ramamurthy, Editor of Economic Justice here at Nonprofit Quarterly, coming to you from Providence, Rhode Island, on land historically stewarded by the Narragansett Nation. For this webinar, our panelists will discuss what organizing for wage justice to combat rising inequality by taking on corporate power looks like and why it's more important than ever. For this conversation, our expert panelists are Saru Jayaraman, the president of One Fair Wage, a national organization of over 300,000 service workers, over 2,000 restaurant employers, and dozens of organizations nationwide, all working together to end all subminimum wages in the United States and improve wages and working conditions in the service sector. She's also the director of the Food Labor Research Center at UC Berkeley and the author of several books, including most recently, One Fair Wage, Ending Subminimum Pay in America. We also have joining us Chirag Mehta, who's the Director of Policy and Ideas at Community Change, a national organization that builds the power of low-income people, especially people of color, to fight for a society where everyone can thrive. And finally, we have Erica Smiley, who's Executive Director of Jobs with Justice, a national network of community labor coalitions driving strategies to expand organizing and collective bargaining power. Smiley is also the co-author with Sarita Gupta of The Future We Need, organizing for a better democracy in the 21st century. I just have a few notes before we begin. First, we're very excited to take your questions. We'll start with a few questions of our own and then we'll get to yours in the audience. Please enter your questions in the questions box at the bottom of your screen and I'll share as many of them as I can. Second, don't worry, we will share the slides and recording after the webinar. Please also join the conversation on social media with our hashtag, hashtag rebuild the economy. And one last thing before we begin the conversation, I would also like to gratefully acknowledge the support of your part-time controller LLC, which provides customized accounting and financial management services for over 1300 nonprofits nationwide. Learn more about their services at yptc.com. Thanks for joining us and please complete the brief survey after the webinar to inform our work and make it better. So we can go ahead and get started. Um, Saru, could you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your work at One Fair Wage and the organization's multi-strategy mission to end the subminimum wage economy? Yes, thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here with Smiley and Chirag and uh, for doing this. And um, and it's, I just feel like you're you're holding this in such a timely historic moment where uh, workers across the country are refusing to work for poverty wages. And of course, in my case in particular, refusing to work for some minimum wages, which is so exciting. Um, so we've been organizing restaurant workers for 20 years and in the last decade launched a campaign called One Fair Wage, in particular to end subminimum wages in the US. Um, the subminimum wage for tipped workers is still $2.13 an hour. It's a direct legacy of slavery. Uh, it's been a source of poverty and sexual harassment for an overwhelming, overwhelmingly female workforce in the United States um, and a huge workforce. In fact, one of the nation's largest workforces, 14 million workers worked in the restaurant industry, even more in the broader tipped service uh, economy pre-pandemic, and uh, that group, as we'll probably talk about, was most was hard to hit as anybody uh, by the pandemic. And that that experience of suffering during the pandemic led to this really incredible upheaval in which millions of these workers are refusing to work for these two dollar, three dollar wages across the country. So our organization has been working to raise wages and end some minimum wages across the country through three main areas of work, policy work. We've been moving bills and ballot measures across the country, industry work. We have a huge association of high road restaurant employers who we work with to actually raise wages, increase equity in their own companies, uh, and actually to go after through shareholder activism and litigation, the, the large restaurant corporations that are really setting the low road standards um, so promoting the high road, fighting the low road. Um, and lastly, narrative shift. We produce a lot of books and videos and films, uh, even got a television a show in the works to really promote the narrative that these that workers in the service sector and all workers in America are professionals 
uh, and require and skilled professionals and deserve to be compensated and treated as such. And that is what I think so many workers right now are waking up to this idea that I do have value, I am skilled, I have worth, and I demand a wage that a compensation that reflects that worth. And so I'm really excited to get into. We have decided to go big in this moment, and I'm really excited to to have that conversation. Thank you so much, Saru. It's certainly a historic moment. Um, Chirag, uh, could you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your role at Community Change, creating policy that improves the material conditions of low-income communities? Absolutely. Yeah. First, uh, just really want to ex express appreciation for the invitation. Uh, couldn't agree more with Saru. Uh, this is absolutely timely conversation. There's actually a lot of exciting uh, movement around the country for wage justice. So just uh, really happy to be here and happy to be uh, in, uh, in conversation with uh, Erica and Saru as well, two people who I really uh, admire. Uh, so Community Change, as you said, is a national organization uh, that builds power from the ground up. You know, we believe that the effective, that effective and enduring social movements have to be led by those uh, most impacted by injustice. And so really since our founding, which was in 1968, you know, we've built the power of people, you know, most marginalized by injustice and especially, you know, people of color, women, immigrants, you know, people struggling to make ends meet and um, really to fight for their vision uh, for a society where all communities can thrive. Um, and I would say, you know, part of our theory, what's really core to our theory of change is that, you know, we have to actively uh, organize uh, to shift power you know, particularly from the wealthy, from big business and shift it to, to ordinary people. Uh, that is really at the heart of our, our theory of change. So, you know, the way we do that is, you know, in addition to organizing support, communications, support, um, and movement sort of convening role, you know, we provide direct strategic policy and advocacy support to local, state, regional organizations and campaigns. And I co-direct a team that provides that support. Um, and, you know, I think the kinds of policy campaigns, the issues have over time ebbed and flowed uh, right now at the heart of our work is the fight for child care justice, which I'll get into a little bit later, uh, housing affordability and, you know, good jobs, you know, making sure everyone who wants a good job has access to a good job, uh, among other issues. But that's that's community change. Thanks so much, Charm. Um, Smiley, could you introduce yourself and talk? a bit about Jobs with Justice and the fight to build power for working people on an economy that works for everyone. Yeah, thank you, Rikitha. And uh, God, what an honor to be here with Chirag and Saru, uh, two of my mentors and heroes in different ways. Um, I'm Erica Smiley. I'm the Executive Director of Jobs with Justice. We are a national network of community and labor coalitions who seek to expand the ways in which and the number of people who can organize and collectively bargain. Uh, and we do that by centering, we win by centering fights against uh, white supremacy and patriarchy as a means of winning, not just because it's morally white, right, but because not doing so uh, guarantees our defeat. Um, and we, we emphasize this theory of change, not simply as a question of workers' rights, but as a question of uh, rebalancing the economy and as a question of democracy that democracy is not just a political project where we're trying to increase the number of people who can vote once a year, we wanna do that too, but it's also a matter of uh, economic decision-making and engaging the largest number of people who are directly impacted by an economic relationship in setting standards, policy, and enforcement of, those, uh, of that industry or of that relationship. And so we really seek to expand bargaining through this framework in order to expand democracy and I think the, the so what of all of that, which I really want to emphasize, um, particularly in this day and age, is not just so that uh, workers can have more power. That's the mechanism through which we can actually win something I'd like to call joy and the ability to attend our kids' soccer games and maybe just work one job, or as my co-author Sarita likes to say, to uh, work to live as opposed to live to work. So that's us in a nutshell. Absolutely. Um, yeah, work to live, not live to work. I'm gonna, that's gonna stick with me for a while. Um, well, let's just get into the questions then. I wanted to open by asking, uh, how do we get here? Uh, how do we understand the sub minimum wage economy and the low wage economy in general? Um, we know that the federal minimum wage has not been raised since 2009 and the effects of the stagnation have only felt worse um, since the COVID-19 pandemic. 
So how did we get to this political economic landscape and what are the core stakes and challenges in the fight for fair wages today? Um, I was hoping that Chirag could set us off and pass it on as you see fit. Thanks, sure. Yeah, happy to start. You know, I would say, you know, how we got here, and uh, I'll explain a little bit of where we are, I think, where I think we are, but how we got here is really decades, you know, in the making. You know, I think most of us have probably seen the chart. If you haven't, you know, go to the Economic Policy Institute website. Uh, they've got a wonderful chart. Uh, I mean, the, the details of the chart are not wonderful, but it's a great chart for illustrating where we are today. It, it shows that over the last, really since 1970, uh, about around 1970, that, that wages have just not kept up with the pace of productivity. In other words, workers, you know, you know, prior to 1970, essentially, you know, as workers were more productive, creating more value, their their wages would go up along, you know, in line with their productivity. In other words, they were getting rewarded for the work um, and the value that they produced. But really, something happens around 1970 where wages essentially flatline, while productivity continues to go up. So workers are creating value, more value every year, but they're not actually seeing the return on that. Um, and that value really is, is, is lost. It's lost value, it's value that is essentially being sucked up by shareholders uh, and, and management for big business. And I think the estimate is if wages had kept pace with productivity, um, workers right now would be earning $10 more per hour than they are. And if you add up all of the lost value to workers over the last several decades, it's give or take $50 trillion in value lost that was distributed upward, you know, from the 99% to the top 1%. So that, that sort of explains sort of where we are at the moment. And there's lots of reasons that explain the imbalance. There's lots of policy change that's happened over the last, you know, 40 years. But a lot of it comes back to an imbalance of power between the wealthy and big business and everyone else. You know, 40 years of attacks on workers' rights, families' economic rights, and civil rights have weakened the ability of ordinary people and workers to enact rules in the workplace and through government that ensure that uh, workers and families get their fair share of the value that they, they produce, uh, and that all people have real self-determination and control over their economic futures, uh, not just in workplaces, but really in larger society. So that's a little bit of where we are, how we got here. I think one thing I want to say, though, is like what's really interesting, and Saru, you know, referred to or mentioned this. I think I, I share a little bit of the excitement about where we are right now. It's you know, what's interesting and exciting about the current moment is that there's real momentum. It really it started before the pandemic, I think, uh, but momentum behind workers' movements to demand more from their employers. And you know, for the first time in 40 years, you know, we're seeing strong wage growth for the bottom 10% and falling wage inequality, which is really remarkable uh, and that we have to take note of. Um, you know, even after taking inflation into account, wages are higher now for the bottom uh, 10% than they were uh, when the pandemic began. Um, so of course we have a long way to go uh, to get to equity, but I'm really encouraged about the dynamics uh, of the current moment. Can I add to that quickly as well? It just, I think, first of all, I'm, I'm really excited that Gerard emphasized this question of power too, because you know we can't talk about wages in a vacuum. We have to talk about it in the context of a, of a political economy. And to the point of how we got here, um, I like to think that the pandemic in particular, and then a lot of things that have happened in between, including you know the, the murder of George Floyd and the uprisings of the Movement for Black Lives, and of course the ongoing crisis we're all witnessing in democracy, that there's also a different awakening to uh, both the power that workers create, our role in the economy. All of a sudden, many workers who were just traditionally considered low wage uh, are now considered essential. And so, you know, are defined not so much by uh, the oppressive exploitation of their sector, but by the power that they hold within the, within the economy. And that's interesting because now you have a, an impetus to, to demand more. And I like to liken this period as a Southerner, as a Black Southerner, I like to liken this period to what I would consider the last great awakening or great resignation, what, what W.B. Du Bois called the largest strike in American history when, when half a million formerly enslaved Black workers simply walked off the plantation, also perhaps newly aware of the power and wealth that they had created for free. And so in this, in this moment in time, I, I'm really excited and I, I can't wait to hear Saru speak because she has lots of different frames that help sharpen this in ways that um, I aspire to, but like that there's, there's a, 
um, a realization that this is not just the result of a tight labor market. It's actually the result of recognizing what has long been the role that many workers in low wage sectors who tend to be uh, women, primarily women, disproportionately women, women of color, people of color, uh, a recognition that they've been holding up the economy and perhaps should demand more. Sorry, you're muted, but feel free to jump in. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I Thank you, Smiley. That was a good segue. I, I do want to take us a little bit back. When we ask, how did we get here? Just as Smiley did, we have to go back. We have to go back further than the last 40 years. We have to go back to emancipation because that emancipation, you know, so much of the wage structures, at least in the service economy, were set at that point. So, you know, I, I'll, I want to give the service sector as an example for everything Shrag and uh, Smiley have been talking about, which is to say, um, you know, tipping originated in, in feudal Europe. It was something that aristocrats and nobles gave to serfs and vassals, but always on top of a wage. If you read old English literature or watch period pieces, you'll see people give tips, but always as an extra or bonus on top of a wage. That idea came to the States in the 1850s when rich Americans started to travel to Europe and come back and try to show off that they knew the rules of Europe. In 1853, met waiters who are mostly men in the U.S. went on strike in major metropolitan cities, you know, New York, Chicago, Boston, Philadelphia. They went on strike for a higher wage. They got a wage. They went on strike for a higher wage. And restaurants in the U.S. replaced them with women as a way to get away with cheaper labor. And then 10 years later, something happened that allowed them to get even cheaper or even free labor, which was emancipation. At emancipation, the restaurant lobby and the service sector more broadly, it was restaurants and the Pullman train company both sought to hire newly freed black people and tell them, well, I'm not gonna pay you, but you're so lucky you're gonna get white people's tips. In some cases, black people were even charged for the privilege of having a position where they could get white people's tips. Shoe shiners, servers, porters, charged for the privilege of obtaining tips. So that idea, that was the moment at which tipping in the US was mutated from being an extra bonus on top of a wage as it had always been to becoming the wage itself. And because it's so important to note, this is not a situation. This is not a situation where there was a, a low wage that just stagnated until today. There was a wage that went down to zero as women and Black people entered this industry, which tells you that you know, the subminimum wage is nothing other than a devaluation of women's work and black life. That is what it is. And it was made law in 1938 as part of the New Deal when so many millions of black workers were left out in so many sectors, including tipped restaurant workers and told you get a zero dollar wage as long as tips bring you to the full minimum wage. And we went from zero in 1938 all the way up to two dollars and 13 cents an hour, the most ridiculous, outrageous and shameful wage that exists, you know, there are lots of horrible subminimum wages in the US. There's a subminimum wage for incarcerated workers, which is a horrible outrage and shame, direct legacy of the 13th Amendment's exception to slave to the ban against slavery in the case of incarceration. There's a subminimum wage for people with disabilities, also an outrage. There's a subminimum wage for youth in many states. There's multiple subminimum wages. This, the thing about the subminimum wage for tipped workers is that it is not a small, you know, it is not a small fraction of our workforce. It is the nation's number one fastest growing private sector employer and the second largest private sector employer in general, 14 million workers uh, are subjected to this ridiculous two-tiered wage structure. And uh, it, to this day, and so 43 states, including many very blue states, uh, are still subject to this. And why? So the question is, why? Well, an entity formed in 1911 called the National Restaurant Association. We call it the other NRA. It's led by the chains. And to Chirag's point and Smiley's point, why are we here? It is because the power of corporate trade lobbies that wield power over both parties. Let us not pretend that Democrats haven't uh, you know, submitted to the ways of the National Restaurant Association and the Chamber of Commerce, because 
look, we had an, a moment last year with the pandemic, with the great resignation to finally end this. You know, the Raise the Wage Act was moving in Congress. It would have raised the wage to 15 and ended the sub minimum wage for tipped workers, workers with disabilities and youth. But five of the eight senators, Democratic senators who voted no on it publicly admitted, I can't do this because the Restaurant Association told me I can't. And so, you, you, you know, it, it, there's no question. It's very obvious. Everybody's being very obvious. What is a question is, are we actually living in a democracy when the vast majority of people you pull in any state, red and blue, you put this on the ballot at any state, red and blue, it passes. You know, you can talk to Republicans and MAGA folks. They will tell you people should get a wage. So what is preventing us? It is not, it is not the will of the people. It is corporate trade lobbies and the power they have over our, over our electeds. But as Shrag said, that is changing. Finally, the fact that so many millions of workers have said enough is enough and restaurants are now having to raise wages to recruit staff has silenced the opposition. And we are about to win one fair wage on the ballot in DC. We are about to win it in Portland, Maine, where you know it's moving in multiple states, at least a dozen states right now because of the momentum and the fact that the opposition is so much more silenced than it has ever been before. That's wonderful, thank you. Do Sorry, did you wanna add anything else about post COVID change or? Yes, absolutely. I'm sorry, I'm taking up so much time. I'll be quick. Um, but I do just want to explain what happened. How did? How is it that we've gone 160 years with workers basically accepting, you know, okay, I'll live on a $2 wage and tips to saying, no, I won't accept it. So many things happen. When, the, when COVID shut down the economy, 6 million workers lost their jobs in the restaurant industry. Two thirds were told they actually couldn't get unemployment insurance because in most states, they were told their wages were too low to qualify for benefits. That was a first wake up call. A lot of workers said, wait a second, if the government is telling me I earn too little to make benefits, maybe I earn too little and I shouldn't accept this. Then millions went back to work. They found tips had gone way down. Harassment, which was already the highest in our industry went way up. And the breaking point was when they were asked to enforce COVID protocols on the same people from whom they had to get tips, they were done. They said, you're asking me to do so much more for so much less, it's not working. And when the cost of gas is more than my hourly wage, it costs me more to get to work than I get from my employer when I get there, goodbye. A million workers have left, millions more say they are leaving. In fact, of the workers we've surveyed still in the industry, 54% say they are leaving. And then the most miraculous thing has happened. Thousands of restaurants across the country, many of whom said they'd go out of business if they actually had to pay a wage, are now paying 15, 20, 25, 30. We even saw restaurants in Cape Cod paying 50 bucks an hour plus tips. And you know, saying I am having to do it to recruit staff and I need policy to create a level playing field. That's the only way this industry is gonna be able to fully reopen. That's great. Thank you for that finer point on where we are right now. So I was hoping that we could turn to intersectional struggles. Um, the subminimum wage for tipped workers, as Saru mentioned, and, and we've been discussing is uh, at the federal level is $2.13 an hour, and 38 states have a wage of $5 an hour or less. Um, these rates disproportionately, as we've been saying, impact black and brown workers in the restaurant industry, especially. So how I, I was hoping we could talk a bit about how wage justice relates um, and kind of impacts other struggles for racial and gender justice. And Smiley, if you want to kick us off on this one, that would be great. Yeah, I could totally kick us off. And, and I could also listen to uh, Saru all day. So uh, you shouldn't feel bad for, for taking time. Um, you look, I think there's so many things I'm going to try not to just like respond and build on on what Saru said. But I do want to say just one thing. And, and there are some real fundamentals here that that it is worth us considering when we talk about wages. In business schools today, like what are people being taught to understand what's required to run a business. Because if what's required includes you have to be able to pay bills, you have to be able to pay for materials and supplies, you have to be able to pay for facilities, why aren't we also saying you have to be able to pay workers in healthcare? Otherwise, you just don't qualify to run a business. You aren't, you aren't a good place. You can't run it. You don't have what it takes, right? So like, I, don't, I, I guess there's also just to turn the question a little bit on its head about um, why employers or the NRA say they can't pay wages, I think it's a little bit of a, a false 
narrative. Um, it's a lot of bit of a false narrative. Okay, to your actual question, sorry. So yeah, race is obviously central to this question as the overwhelming majority of workers in low wage sectors are women and people of color, as I, as I stated before. You know, often the primary breadwinners, these workers depend on, on public assistance to get by. And I know there was a question and some are raising this question of like the benefits cliff and, and what, does that, what does that mean? And, you know, I think that I'd actually like to hear what Chirag has to say on that, because I know he's been a lot of work on it. But one thing is that companies are essentially gaming all of us, right? Like they're, they're socializing costs and risks while privatizing benefits and putting the burden of their low wages on the general population. And, you know, COVID, the pandemic has really shown this. I mean, I think one of my favorite slash, you know, most angering examples is watching how many corporate landlords, um, you know, made bank basically um, through tax relief. So they couldn't get it through wages. Then we put in eviction moratoriums to protect mostly uh, black and brown women from being evicted from their homes in the peak of a pandemic. And then they, they still got that income and that revenue from taxpayers. You know, it's like, so they were, they were doing fine, you know, claiming that they'd otherwise have to lay off their own staff despite not having a large staff and despite paying uh, some of the wealthiest executives in the country. And so this is why I, I just keep harping on this question when we think about the intersection of wages, of race, of gender, that all of this, if we look at the whole picture of wages and we keep wages in relationship with this question of the political economy, we have a much better understanding. And it, it's not a stretch. We aren't trying to like draw lines that aren't there. It's very deeply embedded. You know, um, often companies will push back on wage increases in order to say, pay their investors or shareholders more or pay their executives a lot more. I think uh, Jeff Bezos made 20 billion in just the first quarter of the pandemic. Uh, there was a stat pre-pandemic that he made about $800,000 an hour more than the lowest paid worker. Uh, perhaps you could make just $600,000 an hour more and share some of that. Um, and so, you know, just asking for wage increases without discussing executive compensation and these things leads back to, um, to even, it gives them more things to push back on. It gives them more fuel for opposition, such as um, suggesting that they're gonna transfer the cost of increased wages onto consumers. I know that's true in restaurants. We've seen it be true in retail. And this is one of the key fights that unions and workers have taken on over the years, not just most recently with the teachers unions and other public sectors, but even as early as General Motors in 1945, trying to increase wages without impacting the, the price of cars and of vehicles as a way to support not only their multiracial coalition of workers, but the community those workers were from marching in step, right? And so, you know, it's a false dynamic to assume that that has to be passed on to consumers uh, when in fact it can very easily come out of the billions of profits that, that Chirag mentioned that have, have very quickly during the course of, of COVID-19 been trans transitioned from the 99% up to the top tier of the 1%. And we see this across sector in transit, they're con you know, transit workers wanna increase wages, uh, even just back to some of the public sector standards before many of the companies were privatized, that's pitted against riders fares, you know, Walmart workers wanted to increase wages and the company's like, oh, that's gonna, you know, our base of, of, of consumers is not gonna be able to afford that. And, you know, they were able to prove, even if you just raise them a, a little bit, it would only cost, even if you just put it all on consumers and didn't take any from executive bonuses, it would cost like a dime more per trip. I mean, it's, it's a, a pervasive and in some ways it plays on the, uh, the need that everyday people have, particularly women and people of color have to sustain themselves and make it in this world. And so one of the strategies I wanted to just put forth, and I like was debating back and forth before we started with Chirag about whether or not I was going to do this, but I'm, I'm pulling it off the shelf. I'm dusting this thing off. You know, back in, in 2014, 2015, a few of us tried to create this framework of a low wage employer fee or a bad business fee. And the theory was, look, you know, minimum wage increases were fantastic. They put hard cash in people's pockets. That was important. You know, the Cadillac in some ways was that workers would have some form of organized and collective bargaining power, you know, through a union or some other contract where they could actually enforce, set and enforce and change wages as conditions shifted, right? That, you know, one of the best parts of collective bargaining at its best, at its finest, is that it directly extracts some of that benefit, some of that capital uh, from the employer and puts it in the pockets 
of workers through wages and benefits. But we were like, well, is there an in-between? Because we saw these dynamics even before the pandemic, well before the pandemic, where companies were not only benefiting from uh, exploitative low wages that they were paying to their labor force, but they were also then gaming the system in the sense that those same workers were then dependent on public assistance and uh, other, other public services. And that while we wanted to continue funding and supporting public services, we didn't think those corporations should be benefiting off of it. And so we wanted to, you know, give an incentive to either increase the lowest uh, floor wage and uh, to get it at the time, even over, over 15, well before uh, the, the movement for 15 took off in the way that it did. But, um, but also to say that if you aren't going to pay over this amount per hour per worker, that you actually have to pay a fine into, into a public fund that workers and recipients of these services would then dictate how that money was spent. And we were super clear that it was a fee as opposed to a tax because we didn't want to just put an ATM on the backs of workers in low-wage sectors that could just be distributed in a, in a general budget process in ways that may not be useful. We wanted it to be put into a resource that uh, workers could control. And you know, to date, we still haven't necessarily won a fee like this anywhere. But one of the one of the um, unexpected victories in the state of Connecticut, where we pushed it in 2015, was that some of the companies, including one of the largest employers there, it was Aetna, one of the insurance companies at the time, just preemptively increased their wage to their lowest wage to $16 an hour, uh, just to get ahead of the bill, just in case it passed, so that they wouldn't be uh, impacted by it which to us was a win-win. Well, I mean, we'll take it. You know, <laughs> we wanted, we, the point was to increase wages in workers' pockets. We still have to fight for power ongoing, but uh, to see wages in the context of that, that ongoing conversation around uh, governance and democracy is the key point here. I think, thank you so much, Smiley. I think we'll turn to conversations about democracy in a moment. I just wanted to give Saru and Chiraga a chance to talk about uh, the race and gender question and ask um, that either of you, whether you wanted to follow up on that. Well, Maybe sure I can start. Yeah, yeah, especially if you could address the benefits cliff question, because I know it's come up in the Q&A as well. Well, um, uh, I'm gonna, I'll get to the benefits cliff uh, point in a second. I, I do want to just reinforce something that, that Erica is, is, is driving towards, that you know companies don't want to pay enough uh, for families to afford the basic necessities of life, nor do they want to pay taxes um, so that government can actually deliver um, the public goods that people need, everything from affordable housing uh, to, to uh, food uh, to childcare. And I want to, I, I want to, uh, so that imposed austerity creates all kinds of challenges then, you know, for people to, to get what they need to live. And I want to just single out what's happening in the childcare sector here, because it, you know, the struggle for fair wages and working conditions and dignity for childcare workers is really both sort of a wage justice fight, but it's also a racial and gender justice fight. I mean, the childcare sector has some of the lowest paid workers in the country. You know, the average childcare worker uh, working year round is going to earn about $27,000 a year, you know, clearly a poverty uh, uh, income. And you know, the work is mostly done by black and brown women. And the childcare system we have today, and the reason we have the conditions today, the poverty that it generates is, is because the, it's rooted in the system of slavery in this country uh, and the system for domestic work that was done at the time. I mean, the economy back then depended on stolen labor uh, provided by black women. And the system we have today it, it is dependent on the greatly undervalued labor of black and brown women. Uh, and the challenge really is twofold. Um, you know, first, you know, we're taking on extreme racial and gender segregation and patriarchal norms, uh, a system rooted in the notion that care work is women's work and is of less value. Uh, and you know, we can't approach this struggle like just a policy struggle where we just are trying to convince people that the, the policy that child care workers deserve a, a living wage is, is just right and we have to do it. We have to really take on and challenge the, the sort of under, underlying worldview about care work. Um, along the way that we, we really do have to, to change the notion that, uh, you know, care work is of less value because it's women's work. Um, that's how we're going to, partly how we're going to win. The other challenge is that it's a publicly funded system, right? And so this sort of gets back to the point about corporations. Are they going to pay people enough to uh, afford the basics of life? Or are they going to pay their taxes so that government can actually provide the public good? You know, the path to higher wages is, is through higher revenue. It's through public funding. 
uh, you know, while the system of child care is mostly delivered through private businesses, it's really, you know, the system, at least for low to moderate income families, is publicly funded. It's a public system. Um, we, we can't lift up wages for child care providers without public funding, without more tax revenue. Uh, so in, in essence, you know, we're fighting for, for uh, and we're trying to create vehicles, you know, where government has to be at the table alongside private child care business owners, the workforce, and parents um, to, to set the wages, set the working conditions for the industry, make sure everyone else has access to child care, and that we actually then have the power to raise the revenue to, to fund this system. Uh, you know, what was exciting about Build Back Better for us was that it actually did have a living wage mandate. It required states to have career ladders for child care workers. We are changing, we really are changing a uh, worldview about uh, uh, child care sector, it, child care as an essential public good, how to fund it. Um, we, we just, we need to build more power to, to get there. Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, I, I would just, uh, I would just add uh, everything we're talking about is is uh, <laughs> is 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 real. It's challenging. It's been the way it's been for way too long. And I think on the question of intersectionality and race and gender, there's hope there too. I really do feel a lot of hope there too. Um, you know, because we are seeing this massive rejection. I mean, Shrag is talking about childcare workers. There is as massive of a childcare exodus and shortage as there is a restaurant worker exodus and shortage. And women and people of color are collectively in this country saying, take your low wage job and shove it. Uh, you know, we, we've we been monitoring, you know, million workers have left the industry, women and Black workers in particular have left restaurants at a much higher rate of other workers. They're just done. They, they suffered from much higher, uh, much higher levels of harassment during the pandemic. You know, 60% uh, of all workers said tips went down during the pandemic. Some, over 70% of Black workers said tips went down during the pandemic. 70% of all workers said, if I try to enforce COVID protocols, I get screamed or yelled at or tip less. 85% of black workers said if I try to enforce COVID protocols, you know, I get tipped less and worse. You know, we've had workers, you know, punched, one even shot for trying to enforce these COVID protocols. And so workers are saying we're done. We are done. And uh, and that that is very hopeful. It has led to a lot of rethinking in our in our industry, at least. Restaurants are totally rethinking how they run their businesses. We had a flood of restaurant owners come to us after the murder of George Floyd and over the last two years asking for help to think through how to restructure. And the pandemic itself forced them to rethink things that impact race and gender equity. So for example, there has long been segregation in our industry, people of color in uh, you know, the back of the house, what we call the back of the house, which is the kitchen, whiter workers in the front of the house, the dining room, and even within the front of the house, you've got tipped workers who are bussers, who are people of color and servers who are white workers, severe segregation that is as much a reflection of plantation slavery as the, the wage itself. It's, it comes from the field and the house. It, it's old, horrible stuff. And yet during the pandemic, when there was no dining in and everything was takeout and delivery, suddenly everybody had to work together. It all became one house. And everybody got a full wage and tips were shared and employers found, whoa, this is a way better system. I like it a lot better. And we saw so many thousands of restaurants move in this direction because they, they suddenly had to, they had to, they had to, they had to think differently. So I, I just think as much as we are concerned about these intersectionality issues, there's also a lot of hope that in fact, workers of color and women are the ones who are gonna lead us to a different future on this issue. I gotta add to that, sorry, like other than just saying a quick amen and that there's so much hope, like it, I'll speak specifically to like what we're seeing within companies like Amazon and Starbucks, right? These upsurges of workers. And when you when you ask workers what, what it is that motivated them, yes, they want more compensation. Yes, they wanna be treated with respect and dignity in relationship to their, their wages. And many of them were radicalized by the, the murder of George Floyd. Like when you listen to Big Mike in Alabama, or even when you look at, at Chris Smalls, who was arrested for asking for uh, personal protective equipment, 
like many of the people who voted yes for the union were voting yes against white supremacy, were, who basically said, you know, I think it was Big Mike who said, you know, I realized that this was our this was our movement for black lives right here on the shop floor. And so when we don't center the fights against white supremacy and patriarchy, when we're organizing and supporting workers in this moment, we're missing a big opportunity. We're missing in a, engaging workers as whole people and we're missing the motivating factor that's allowing so many people to take risks that they may not have been able to take before, to stick their necks out. And to be very clear, like this, this great resignation, part of why I think the framing of it is off is that uh, what the, the relief that workers have gotten in this period and through the, the realization recognition of their roles as essential, and then of course, through these other motivating factors such as around their race, their gender and other identities, that workers aren't just, they aren't leaving the workforce per se. There are some, right, who've taken retirement, whatever, but a lot of workers are just leaving those three jobs to work one so that God forbid they can go to their kids' soccer and basketball game on Saturday morning and experience a dignified life. So just wanted to build on, on Saru's point there because I think it's critical. There's a ton of hope. And sorry, okay, last thing I'll say, again, Southern, Southern Black person channeling that, uh, is that so, in some instances when we do this, we identify some of the most militant people in our movement. The, and, and it's not that they're new, right? I mean, women, people of color have been leading courageous efforts for, for centuries, right? But that by not engaging them as whole people in these fights for fair wages and compensation, we as a movement are leaving potentially our most militant power base on the table. And anybody that thinks or wants to win, anybody who wants to imagine a real democracy worth fighting for knows that you have to make a strategic calculation. You don't, you never, never leave your power on the table. Truer words have never been spoken. Um, so we have, uh, a, you know, maybe five more minutes, four or five more minutes for our last couple of questions before I want to turn to an audience question or two. So I'm going to kind of combine them. We wanted to talk about um, the relationship between wages and democracy, how anti-worker policy threatens and undermines democracy, but also how we might build democracy and social transformation with pro-worker policy. Um, and, you know, maybe in answering that, we could talk about, uh, you know, a strategy to transform the economy with it alongside it. So like, what is an organizing strategy to kind of win that thing, if that makes sense? So uh, sorry, I'm gonna let you lead and um, go ahead and chime in. Yeah, like everything we've been talking about, there have long been challenges on this question of wages and democracy. And now there's like this incredible moment of hope. So the challenge as we've articulated it is that, you know, corporate trade lobbies like the National Restaurant Association have, uh, artificially stagnated wages in this country with frankly, very radical policy. It's radical to stagnate the wage as much as it has been. It's a radical to pay people, radical right to pay people $2 when the overwhelming majority of Americans agree uh, that it needs to be a full livable wage for everybody. Um, so that it clearly the issue of wages is all about democracy is is so much bigger than wages. It is about fundamentally who controls our democracy. Is it corporate trade lobbies or is it the people? But I just wanted to share that I find so much hope in this moment of this issue actually helping to actually change our democracy in multiple ways. And what do I mean by that? So we have been in the business of putting this issue directly on the ballot in a number of states over the last couple of years. We put it, we collected 400,000 signatures to put this on the ballot in Michigan in 2018. And the Republicans who control the legislature in Michigan understood something that unfortunately some Democrats don't seem to understand, which is that this would turn out millions of low wage workers, unlikely voters, people of color, women of color. And so they took it off the ballot in 2018, made it law. Republicans raised the wage from three to 12 in 2018 in Michigan. But with the rallying cry, we're doing this just to keep people from voting. They said that publicly. We promised to gut this after the election. So what did we do? We ran a voter program with 100,000 workers where we had workers tell each other, we just want to raise, but where they're going to take it away, let's go vote. We saw a 300% voter turnout increase among unlikely low wage voters and a 400% voter turnout increase among young people in particular. 
we know this issue, whether it's on the ballot or just the center of a campaign, turns people out to vote. We know that it is like the most important issue, at least for the lowest wage workers. I mean, it's their survival. And so we, know, we are putting it on the ballot again in multiple states, both this midterm election and for the presidential, because we know that it's one of the best ways to mobilize people to engage them civically. And for people for whom wages are not the most important issue, perhaps it's climate change, perhaps it's reproductive justice. I think what these multiple cycles show you, look at Florida, more people voted for 15 than either Trump or Biden. And uh, unfortunately, the Democrats didn't embrace that in Florida and didn't win as a result. Uh, but what we know, what we know going forward is that if we want the political will to win on pretty much any issue, any other issue, or to engage in the kind of big transform transformative change that's being discussed in the chat, if we want the political will in this country to win those things, we have to put the things that matter to people, that are on people's minds the most, the things that allow them to survive on the ballot directly directly in front of people so they're able to go vote themselves a raise and then vote for all the issues that we're worried about and the people we need them to vote for while they're there. But they're not going to do it. They're not going to engage politically when they see both parties leave them behind at two and three dollars over generations. And so the, the stagnation of the wage is a democracy question, is a political question. But I'm saying we can flip it and use the stagnated wage and the chance to raise the wage in this moment as a way to flip the democracy, not just on this issue, but on so many other issues as well right now. Yeah, I just want to jump in on this. I think, you know, this connection that Sarah was making between, um, you know, building democracy in the workplace, democracy in the economy um, is deeply connected to actually having real power and democracy, you know, in government. I mean, these things are so intertwined. And I think, you know, the history from, I mean, the history sort of proves this, you know, that that when, I mean, of course, I mean, there's, you know, you go, I didn't, earlier I made a sort of comment that, you know, prior to 1970, wages are rising with productivity. I didn't mean to paper over the fact that there was actually, you know, lots of racial and gender inequity prior to 1970. But the reality is that when, when unions, for example, were strong, we had more power in government. We, you know, worker organizations are essential to having power over government and over actual policy uh, that governs the economy at large, not just within the workplace, but across workplaces. And so I just want to talk a little bit about just, you know, the current moment and what's so exciting and, and, and the role that sort of policy plays. And it speaks to, I think, you know, why we really need to translate you know, worker power into to, to political power in the government sphere. You know, we have a tight labor market now, and it's not by accident. Uh, it's not it's, it's not the only factor here that's explaining, uh, you know, why, uh, you know, workers have more power. But the reality is that the, the, the policy of the American Rescue Plan, you know, other federal policy has actually contributed to the tight labor market that we see today. And workers, you know, they're, they're able to quit their bad jobs and find better jobs. Um, that's a direct result of of policy. Now, a tight labor market is not a replacement for organizing. In fact, it's it's, it's actually a byproduct of organizing. Uh, but it, it's it is necessary for fruitful organizing. I think at scale. Uh, so, you know, the central goal of fiscal and monetary policy has got to be uh, to ensure that anybody who wants a good job can find a good job, no matter your identity, whether your no matter your race, your immigration status, your gender. And I think the pandemic era programs, um, you know, the, the, the unemployment insurance, the cash payments, the tax credits, the lower health care costs, the money that went to states that now states are using to help make life more affordable for families. All of these things helped uh, help, you know, give workers and their families an opportunity uh, to find better work and to demand more from their employers. Uh, you know, basically workers translated, you know, the, the, the income that they derive from these programs into actual wage demands. Um, yeah, the great resignation term gets thrown around a lot. Well, we didn't, well, it wasn't really a great resignation. It really was a great reshuffling or a great upgrade. Um, there's some real wage growth that is taking place right now because of this, because of, you know, what we actually were able to do, you know, through government, um, you know, under the, the Biden administration. None of it's perfect. But it is a lens into how we can translate, 
you know, real worker power into broader economic power and political power. And it, it, I feel like it's also fair to say, Chirag, like based on what, what you just shared, right, that I, you know, we're, we're talking back and forth, we're like, oh, wages, we're, it's connected to democracy and all this stuff. But like, I feel like our opposition has never been clearer that democracy is a threat. Or maybe they've always been clear. I don't know. But like, I feel like they're clearer than us sometimes as a movement, right? Like the Federalist Society, like they were very intentional. They attacked voting rights over the past multiple decades uh, or century. They attacked the ability to form a union and they attacked uh, the ability to control uh, debt. And particularly like on campuses, like with students, with student fees, right? And made it impossible. And so when you think about the things that help dictate wages, Saru said we have to exercise our political power. Chirag says we have to be able to form unions and collectively negotiate. That's that's the, the easiest pathway to get more money in our pockets. And we have to be able to have the intellectual uh, stability to like continue to make those demands and to inspire people to know that they should even ask for those things. That that those are the pillars of democracy. And so it's it's not just to say this because it's a unique moment that wages are connected to democracy or that organizing is connected, is the way that we get to democracy, but that it's actually fundamental and that our opposition for centuries has been clear. I often like to point out my favorite nemesis, John C. Calhoun, who was like Senator from South Carolina, vice president at some point, who was so clear about his God-given right to exploit people, who was so clear that democracy was actually a barrier to being able to paternalistically protect the masses or, or whatever it is he thought he was doing. And so I actually think that many who descend from him, the Koch brothers, the, the George Mason, you know, center for whatever, whatever it is, you know, they, they descend from that school of thought. And until we actually begin to center these issues in the shared framework of the fact that we are unapologetic, unapologetically pro-democracy, that that does not just mean we get to like vote safely, but that it means we have active consult confer decision making in all aspects of our lives. And that these are these are the ways that that shows up. And this is the ultimate benefit that we all get to to reap from it as a society, then we will continue to be vulnerable to, to divide and conquer tactics. Thank you so much, Smiley. Um, thanks all of you for answering in real time the questions in the chat. I'm, you know, this is the time that we would normally turn to audience questions. And so I just want to give you all a chance to follow up on some of the ones that we've talked about here. Um, there's a conversation going on right now about uh, what, you know, that the common counter argument to the idea of fair pay is the free labor market, that if you don't like your job, you can go and get another job and that you can be replaced. Um, Smiley and Saru have sort of responded to this by saying, well, we need to make unions stronger. And Saru has said that we've been moving bills and ballot measures in order to raise wages and their actual strategies to combat this. Chirag, did you have anything that you wanted to add in order to counter the counter argument against the free labor market that if you don't like it, you can go elsewhere? Well, I think we have to take seriously that, you know, for, for people, you know, sometimes their work is actually like what they want to do. Like take a child care worker, just as an example. They, the work itself isn't necessarily replaceable for them. They love what they do. That's why they do the child care work. And they absolutely have a right uh, to demand that that work be fairly paid. And so, um, and we have to protect that right. That's a really important fundamental democratic right in this country that, wherever your job is, whatever you choose to do for your work, that it is fairly compensated. You can, you have a livable wage, you have the work, safe working conditions, and that you have the right to actually join with your coworkers um, to collectively bargain with your employer. That is a fundamental human right. Um, and so uh, I, I'll, I'll just stop there. I think that's just something we have to remind ourselves of, that people choose their work sometimes because that it's their life work. They care about their work. They, that, that, that's something that they actually value, and that's what they want to do with their lives. And they shouldn't have to um, uh, uh, suffer through bad working conditions, bad wages, just because they chose to do to provide child care. I mean, especially when we're talking to like the audience, so like the nonprofit quarterly, right, where most of us argue that we chose this work because we felt you know, moved to it and compelled to it, that, that there's dignity in the work that people choose. And how it is valued in society has nothing to do with the actual value it provides to society in most cases. And in fact, many of the jobs we would consider today as good jobs, manufacturing jobs, that it only came through struggle by working people, by our ancestors, to turn those 
auto jobs, manufacturing, mining, whatever, you name it, into good jobs. And the same thing is now true for workers throughout the service industry, throughout food, throughout child care, right, through all these, these industries that have traditionally been considered uh, women's work or devalued labor, right, are now uh, fighting to say, well, I like this job. It should be a well-paid, well-compensated job, and I should have some ability to set that through organizing with my coworkers. And then this other thing I want to say, which I think speaks to another question as well, but like, again, because we're in the realm of nonprofit, like this is you know, non MPQ and like the nonprofit uh, world, right? Is that when we think about democracy and even like our role in it, I think that there's there is something to be said to just ask the question of how even we came to be as an industry, right? Like when, like, why is it that uh, uh, the Chamber of Commerce put out a report a few years ago identifying several nonprofits as unions as opposed to 501c3 organizations? It wasn't because they wanted us to have more power and to organize. It was because they wanted to limit our activity and what we could do. And why is it even that that nonprofits have such strict rules about how we can participate or not participate in elections. It was actually like a political trade-off deal between like Lyndon Johnson and someone else, but ultimately to curb our ability to freedom, our freedom of association, to, to make it harder for people to practice everyday democracy. And so I think there is something to say both about modeling what it means to be democratic within the nonprofit sector, because we can, because we're mission driven, right? Because we have this access to resources, but to also recognize our role as custodians of a future democracy where you don't have to exist in this way, where we don't have to, I think we're one of the only movements in the world that's funded by the rich uh, through philanthropy, right? Like part of what's, what's brilliant about unions, what's brilliant about uh, you know, student fees was brilliant about many of these historic democratic movements that our opposition has curbed for the past century is that they had not only the ability to pull together a lot of people, but the ability to organize resources in a way that was also democratic and called people in no matter how much they had to contribute. And so I would just want to like also insert that into the discussion, both as we're talking about the dignity of work, but also the role of democracy in everyday lives, as opposed to a job or a thing that feels more like a burden or a responsibility. That's, that's something that we want to potentially aspire to. And I just want to add to this question of like a free labor market, they can go uh, do whatever they want. Obviously they've been saying that forever. And then workers have done that. They have left. They said, you, you told us we could go do something else. Goodbye. They have done it. And then what was the response from the same people who said, oh, go do whatever you want. You know, if you don't like it, leave. Then the response was, oh, they're lazy. They're staying home collecting unemployment insurance. They, uh, what's wrong with them? What, oh, there was, <laughs> did you guys see the leaked uh, uh, email from the Applebee's franchise operator in the Midwest saying it's such a good thing that gas prices are going up because yeah. it will force our low, very low wage workers to come back for low wages. Not just cruel, but so dumb, so dumb, because nobody is going to go to work for $2.13 when gas costs $4.50. You're not gonna do it. And so workers have done exactly what this comment asked them to do. They've used, they, they didn't like it, they left. So why are you blaming them? The way to get them back, I think the realization of the people who always said it's a free market, let them go do whatever they want, is that then suddenly they realize they don't actually have enough people to operate their businesses. And that the only way the economy is going to be able to fully recover is by paying people more. That is the only way. If 54, if a million workers have left the restaurant industry and 54% of those who remain are leaving, and most restaurants we're talking to are saying, I'm not operating at more than 40% capacity, there will not be a way for the restaurant industry at least to come back unless the wages go up. And by the way, workers are not buying individual restaurants raising wages. They don't buy it because they know those, were, those businesses to, could go back to two and three dollars next year. The only thing that's gonna get workers to come back is policy that guarantees them, this is the future. We, we are guaranteeing you, this is the permanent wage going forward. It's worth coming back to work in these businesses. 
Thank you everyone so much for a super lively conversation on this. Um, I knew that, you know, an hour was never going to be enough. I could talk to you folks all day. I want to thank our amazing participants, not only for talking to each other really brilliantly, but also for, in, you know, answering audience questions in the chat as we went along. And thank you, the audience, for joining us for this month's Remaking the Economy. Please complete the survey that we sent out so we can keep giving you content that you like and have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. Bye, everyone.